Good day chaps. So today's video is going to cover an exceptional tank. A vehicle that, were it not for political reasons, could have been a winner and one of the very few vehicles to have been given an outstanding rating in tests and yet today no longer remains. This is the story of the Vickers Mark 7. The Mark 7 begins, ironically, with the failure of its predecessor, the Vickers Mark 4, which we've covered in another video. But to briefly surmise, the Mark IV began as a private venture to produce a tank that used a lightweight, all-aluminium hull with chopper armour for a mid-budget export market. No official MOD request or GSR was ever issued, and this was entirely a Vickers Finance project. As such, there was always an inherent risk of investing before a customer was found. Nevertheless, the tank would have several good features, such as the concept of a universal turret that could readily adopt a number of different guns and electronics to suit a client's needs. Yet the vehicle itself was found to have some very severe flaws. Notably, the aluminium hull was prone to warping, poor visibility for the driver, and external features that were unusable due to the layout, such as being unable to refill its own fuel tanks easily. These issues, by the first, would have probably been fixable but the tank itself was badly damaged when it fell off its transport and landed upside down. With the damage to the hull, as well as mounting costs, that project was cancelled. The universal turret concept, however, had shown enough promise that it was modified and then shipped down to Ingesa in Brazil and fitted to the EET-1 Osorio tank. Itself a good tank, if somewhat a poorly managed company. And that tank would also never go into production. The turret itself was then said to have been shipped back to the UK, but there are some severe doubts about that as it's still fitted to the tank in Brazil. Vickers still felt that there was a future in their universal turret, and, not to put a fine point on it, were also somewhat in need of a sales boost. With the Mark IV failing, as well as a score of vehicles that had gained only lukewarm reception or poor sales and indeed, in some cases, no orders at all, and thus having yet to learn from past lessons, Vickers set out to do it all over again, in designing a tank for an export market before establishing any potential buyers. This led to the development of the Mark 7, which would be based on a modular concept optimised for the export market by focusing on a customer's needs and adaptability to suit the buyer. The universal turret could fit either the Royal Ordnance L11 gun, the French Giot 120mm gun, or a German 120mm smoothbore and secondary fire came in the form of a coaxial Hughes chain gun. The fire control system was also variable and adaptable, but included a Marconi Centaur fire control system, an SFIM VS580-10 gyro-stabilised roof-mounted panoramic sight and laser rangefinder, a Vickers L31 gunner's telescope and rangefinder, and a Philips UA9090 gyro-stabilised roof-mounted thermal imaging unit. This gave the Mark 7 an excellent first hit chance, even on the move, and later tests would back this up. The hull of the vehicle was with that of a Leopard 2 from Krauss Maffei in Germany, which was somewhat of a controversial choice and could reflect on two issues. The first, as mentioned, was that Vickers were getting a little more desperate, and such a move in working with a German tank firm could indeed save a lot of time and money, and due to the long running feud with British Royal Ordnance factories, any partnership with the other British domestic tank producing facilities was not likely to pan out. Jumping into bed with Jerry, who was quickly dominating the European market, would have made some fiscal sense. The situation in Germany was also favourable to Vickers, as Germany had some pretty stringent export laws on selling arms. Germany during the 80s could and did export weapons, but was very selective with selling anything that could be used to breach human rights or be used against its own populace with respect to nations that had a past history of doing this. Thus for a while it would not export tanks to various nations even when asked, including the Middle East, India, Egypt and so on. Yet by joining up with Vickers, Krauss Maffei had only theoretically been supplying armoured hulls, not tanks, and this loophole could circumnavigate the rules. This was not the first time this had been done, as previously Alvis had also cozied up to the Germans with their future main Battle Tank 95 concept, for the same reasons. The Leopard 2 hull came with the MTU MB873KEA501 
four-stroke, 12-cylinder turbocharged diesel engine, developing 1500 brake horsepower, and coupled to a Renk HSWLL 354.3 hydrodynamic steering and shift transmission, with four forward and two reverse gears, and a power to weight ratio of 27.34 brake horsepower per tonne, which on paper gave the vehicle a top speed of 72 km per hour. But in tests, it exceeded this speed easily. So how did this vehicle do? Well, one of the earliest potential customers was Egypt, and it has been hinted that they might have been one of the reasons the vehicle was built, as they approached Vickers requesting trials as soon as possible. This would be done by the ATDU team, with the first test taking place in Lulworth in 1986 to familiarise the crew with the tank. The results, published in ATDU Report 506, were that this vehicle was outstanding, and unbelievably, no flaws could be found or any issues that could not be fixed by a simple tweak by the crew. Their first impressions was that it was fast, very fast, and there was almost no engine smoke at all. And even at high speed, the ride was comfortable and relatively quiet thanks to its deal tracks. Some 750 kilometers were run, along with gradient and obstacle tests, all of which were passed, being written up as automotively outstanding. And bear in mind, ATDU were not Vickers shills. If there was something that could be griped about, gripe they would. But yet at the end of the day, only 10 minutes of maintenance was ever needed. This only got better on the firing range using the L11 gun fitted, with 10 degrees of gun depression and 20 degrees of elevation, and firing out at ranges to 2 kilometers, the range limit at Lulworth. The weapon fired APDS tracer and HESH practice rounds, with one round per target. Now statically, the tank scored a 94% success rate in hitting the targets. Yet on the move, something went wrong, as the accuracy dropped down to an unacceptable 50%. This was found to be an issue with the interim measures necessary to mate the different equipment modules together, which had not undergone compatibility checks. The shooting on the move had affected the elevation gearbox, which had been unable to cope with the torque produced by the elevation motor in order to achieve gun sight coincidence. This was then retrofitted with the Vickers gearbox from the Valiant Mark IV tank, which lacked the finesse of the original, but it was recorded as a human error in fitting rather than any inherent fault and was an easily a fixable issue. The fire control system was marked down as easy to use and comfortable and was particularly effective in the commander being able to select a new target while the gunner was engaging the first, mark the target which would then be programmed into the gunner's system and then go on to mark another target and so on. This allowed the tank to take only four seconds between two different targets and was only hindered by the ability of the loader to keep up. The SFIM site was also considered excellent, with the commander able to selectively aim and engage any part of the target, as opposed to aiming just centre mass. The next major trial was off to Egypt, from August to October 1985, to test the vehicle. The Egyptian government wanted to assess the vehicles based on mobility, firepower, maintenance and static tests, and no armour tests were needed. The mobility was again remarked upon as outstanding, so much so that it could be driven and even poorly handled and mistreated in the worst conditions and still work. The tank was to do some 3,000 kilometres of running, consisting of loose sand, cross-country and road use. In the loose sand and dunes, the Mark 7 was still able to do up to 60 kilometres an hour at top speed, while the road test, in which they remarked that only one track was on the tarmac and one in the sand due to the narrow road, was able to achieve a top speed of 80 kilometres an hour exceeding even the manufacturer's figures. Not only was it able to keep the speed up, but it was able to do it in the 40 plus degrees Celsius in the noon sun. When it came to the maintenance checks, the Egyptian armed forces looked on in some amazement as no spills or leaks were present and no sand had entered the engine bay. The firing tests, however, were somewhat more problematic again. The optical system was playing up in two areas, the thermal sight and the muzzle reference system. The first, after multiple checks, turned out to be down to a pebble. This had somehow got into the elevation rack and broke four teeth, and thus the thermal optics and gun were offline. This was fixed on site, but a note was made to add a screen back home. The second issue, the MOS was found to have just four loose screws, which were quickly fixed, and the weapon was once again back to its high accuracy on the move. Overall, the vehicle passed with flying colours, and other than the usual please can you check stuff before sending abroad Vickers type memo, both the ATDU and the Egyptian forces who got to test it 
found themselves very impressed. The vehicle would then be sent back to the UK. Now the next trial was initiated by Vickers on the 30th of September 1987. This year had not been a good year for the UK MOD. It was the first demonstration of their Challenger tank at the Cats, and it failed miserably, coming last in every event by quite some margin. Over the years, the hows and whys have been gone over in heated debates in the decades after. But what remained true was that the vehicle had performed so badly it caused the UK to throw all of its tea bags out the pram, so much so that they would not even turn up for the next two events. Thus, Vickers thought they could rub some piss into these wounds by offering to recreate a mock CATS test in Lulworth and wanted to pit their Mark 7 against the Challenger. And oddly, the MOD agreed. They did note that while the target type and so on could be recreated, it would not be 100% the same, as there was only a 1 versus 1 challenge and there wasn't the same competitive pressure. Nevertheless, the Challenger 34KA66 and the Mark 7 turned up. The first test was done to range in. The Challenger was given a target at just 1 km, the Mark 7 at 1500 meters. And off the bat, things didn't go too well for the Challenger, missing two of its six targets while the Mark 7 easily hit all six. This was followed by on-the-move shooting with a focus on engagement times, the Mark 7 averaging 12 seconds to Challenger's 21 seconds, with some of her shots taking as much as 31 seconds apart. The last part was just mobility tests, and the Mark 7 finished some 15 minutes before Challenger came back. This was yet another blow for the MOD, who had been shown up again. A final test came in a joint forces test when the decision to purchase Challenger 2 was underway. In this test she would face off against an M1 Abrams, a Leopard 2, Challenger and for some reason a Chieftain. And once again the Mark 7 won the contest. Now only one question remains, that of naming, as two distinct names appear, Vickers Mark 7 and Mark 7 II. Quite why it has never been thoroughly established, even between those who are working on the project. The only real difference noted is that there are two turrets. Both are universal, but differing in shape and armour layout. Brochures indicate that the straight sloped front was the 7-2, while the old cornered model was the Mark 7, and to date no Mark 7-1 has ever been listed. Even more confusingly is that even Vickers seem to get themselves muddled up at several entries, and they refer to both as Mark 7 or vice versa. Nor was the slopey fronted turret a newer turret, as photos have existed being tested on a Mark 4. So that leads to the question, if this tank was so good, why is it not fielded today? What happened to it? Well, apart from the usual grumblings about it being half German, not proper British, the real reason was down to Germany. In the later 80s, the Germans decided that tank hulls could not be exported either, with this news, there was now no order for the Mark 7 with Egypt, and soon Vickers would settle their long-standing dispute with the Royal Ordnance Factories by simply buying the company out during the Tory nationalisation programmes, thus acquiring Challenger and any subsequent vehicle contract. Yet their hubris would be short-lived, as they in turn were swallowed up and dissolved by BAE in 2004. The fate of the Mark 7 is unknown, and no records seem to remain. It's more than likely the hull was returned to Germany, and the turret simply scrapped. Quite an ignoble end to what was an outstanding tank. Well guys, I hope you liked that. If you did, please do give it a like and subscribe. We're trying to get this channel to grow a little bit more these days. And if you've got any other topics or subjects you want to know, please let me know in the comments. But until next time, toodle pip.